Wait, wait, let me paint. Thank you. A number of guests duly introduced by fellows beg leave to attend your meeting. Um, is it your pleasure that I um, welcome them in your name? Thank you. Minutes. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Society of Antiquaries. Welcome to those online as well. These are the minutes of the ordinary meeting, Thursday, the 14th of March, 2024, with Swansea University. Professor Martin Millett, president in the chair. The minutes of the ordinary meeting on Thursday, the 7th of March, 2024, were read and signed. The following communication was then laid before the society, the city in the castle and the castle in the city. New perspectives on the archeology span and history of Old Sarnum by Dr. Alex Langlands, FSA. Thanks for return for the communication. The president announced that the next meeting would be the Thursday, the 21st of March, 2024, and adjourned the meeting. Reception followed. Is it your pleasure that I sign these minutes as a true and complete record? Thank you. We now come to the main business of today's meeting, which is to hear a paper, Heritage in Danger, Assessing and Documenting the Impact of the Conflict in Libya by Professor Anna Leone. Anna is professor at Durham University in the Department of Archaeology. She is an active field archeologist, has conducted field work in Italy, Jordan, and across the North African region. Her research and publications focus is on problems related to the evolution of North African cities from late antiquity to the Arab conquest, and to issues of the economy of the Mediterranean between the sixth and the ninth centuries. Since 2014, she has been actively working for the documentation and protection of at-risk heritage affected by conflict with a specific focus on Libya and Tunisia. Anna, the floor is yours. <laughs> Okay. Uh, President, fellows and guests here present in the room and at home, uh, at home uh, online, uh, I'm very honored today uh, to be here to present the results of some of my work, uh, focusing in particular on, on Libya, uh, where I have been working uh, documenting the heritage since 2014. I would start immediately with the um, with the discussion and with the evidence, and I apologize as it's gonna be very archeological, but that's what I'm doing. <laughs> um, Libya is a country which possesses a unique heritage and an invaluable set of sites which are dated from the prehistoric Roman and medieval period. It has overall five UNESCO World Heritage sites that you can see 
In red in this map, Cyrini, Lepkis Machina, Sabrata, Gadame, Sintadrata, Kakus. The Tadrata Kakus with the <coughs> With this uh, uh, rock art, very famous for prehistoric rock art, Cyrene, which is a Greek foundation and a rich Roman city whose monuments and unique funerary architecture and statuary are well known. And I should stress that Cyrene has been recently heavily hit by a flood, and some of the archaeological sites have been heavily damaged by this. So it's always a, a, um, at risk. And then the two uh, major monumental Roman cities, both the Punic Foundation as Emporia of uh, Sabratha that you can see here, and Lepkis Magna that was uh, monumentalized by the Emperor Septimius Severus when he became uh, emperor because this was his place of birth. So as unique set of uh, uh, archeological remains and uh, the city of Gadames, uh, which is the uh, a local uh, medieval uh, ha um, city that continued to be occupied until uh, <clears throat> uh, 1920 and uh, is uh, still well maintained nowadays. All these sites acquired the status of what heritage um, sites between 1982 and 1986. And from 2016, they have been put in the list, list of endangered sites because of the political instability which has followed the revolution in 2011 and the damage to the sites that this situation has caused. Beyond these sites, the World Heritage Sites, Libya has an incredibly rich heritage, both tangible and intangible. And the project I'm doing actually is also recording intangible heritage, but I will focus on tangible today. So through a series of case studies today, I will, I will illustrate the several problems that the unstable and conflictual situation poses in relation to the heritage protection in this region. In doing so, I will illustrate the results of some of the projects which I've been uh, leading or co-leading since 2014, when my collaboration with the Department of Antiquities of Libya restarted after the revolution in 2011. The work has mostly encompassed a training in Tunisia with Libyan colleagues, first with the collaboration of the Deutsche Archaeologische Institute in Rome until 2017, then with the project training in action from 2017 to 2019 funded by the Cultural Protection Funds, then a project to evaluate the impact of the Sabratha theater, of the conflict on the Sabratha theater in collaboration with the University of West England, Lisa Moll, funded, funded by Gerda Enkel. And finally, from 2002 and still ongoing, the two projects at the edge of the mountains funded by Alif and the Partnership for Heritage funded by the Cultural Protection uh, Funds which I am both running in collaboration with Lisa Moll, uh, and they are focusing on the region of Tatawin and, and in Tunisia and the Nafusa in Libya. I will present here a few case studies concentrating mostly on the type of approaches taken and the issues encountered to illustrate the methodology used and the challenges that I found. I should start by saying that thanks to the extensive training I have previously conducted to heritage professionals, uh, Libyan heritage professional in Tunisia, some of the work that I'm presenting today has been conducted by uh, Libyan colleagues on the field, led or directed by us from, uh, um, from uh, uh, the UK. In other cases, the type of work and the new methodology applied has made imperative for us to be present on the sites, given that the access to Libya is very difficult, these are sometimes incredibly delayed our, our work. So I will start from an overview of the issues in general recorded in the wider heritage landscape of Libya with a case study of the Jebel Nafusa, and I will then move to specific case studies uh, to illustrate in more detail the problems. So the territory of the Jebel Nafusa is inhabited by a mixed community of Arabs and Imazigen, the Berbers, an indigenous population of North Africa. 
I cannot go into details to discuss the ethnic issues of the Amazigh population, as this is not the focus of this paper, but just to give you some details, their distribution on the territory is transnational. Uh, they are present in small groups in different parts of North Africa, from Egypt to Morocco, and speak the Tamazigh language, which is a branch of Afroasiatic language family. In the Nafusa, the heritage is particularly under threat, also due to the complex na nature of the landscape, and some of the sites are really impossible to reach, and the overall incredible number of sites and monuments dated to different periods present in the region. In the 70s, moreover, people were encouraged to move to modern villages, and so the traditional architecture was pro uh, progressively abandoned. And in 2011, the Nafusa was at the center of the conflict, where the clashes between the army and the rebel militias were among the harshest, suffering major destructions. Because of these reason, reasons, the Nafusa has never been the center of major efforts for the documentation and preservation of the heritage. A survey was carried out, and you see in the plan with the red dots, by uh, in the 70s under, under the direction of James Allen, and uh, it was conducted with the team included Philip Kerrick, Owen Brogan, and Mohamed Warfali, who later wrote, who later wrote his PhD on uh, this region. Uh, the surveyed area was principally in the territory and near Jadu, uh, and you can see the three areas with the red dots here. <clears throat> Due to the imposing remains, the major focus of the study of the Nafusa has been primarily over the mosques, their typology and the varied architectural forms of these mosques, and their historical importance in local communities. The same mosques have, always been, have also been the subject of a recent work published by Virginie Prevost, and uh, the same area was surveyed before 2011 by an Italian team who published a series of papers on settlements, environmental character, water supply, and the architecture of the mosque. We also conducted a, a small survey, which are the black dots in this map, in 2014 that we used for training on GIS mapping uh, with the um, with a Libyan archaeologist. The current project of Tatawin, which is in modern Tunisia, and the Nafusa, which is in modern Libya. The two areas are part of the same geographical context, and they were interconnected in antiquity and deployed a main, uh, along the main traded routes. And you can see here the continuity of these sites along this direction. Our work has had a double function. On one side, the documentation of sites and monuments using drone and 3D photogrammetry, LIDAR, GIS recording, assessment and an analysis of conservative conditions and stone deteriorations, and the impact of climate change to provide a long-term management plan for these regions. On the other side, the project is aiming to collect new data for the study of these geographical areas, which despite being in modern times in two neighboring countries, were part of the same landscape in antiquity and medieval time. The project, in fact, is also creating a new museum for the historical interpretation of the region in uh, uh, Shenini, that you can see here in Tunisia, and one in uh, Kabau, that you can see here in Libya. The training for our Libyan colleagues has been conducted in the region of Tatawin in Tunisia, because to facilitate, as is often difficult for us to obtain the visa. And I will therefore briefly start from the region of Tatawin in Tunisia before moving to, to Libya and talk more in depth to the about the challenges brought by the conflict and the climate change. So given the audience today, I will try to focus primarily on Roman remains, but I will have to focus occasionally on medieval constructions and later constructions. <clears throat> so the area of the Wadi Zendag is, uh, uh, that you have seen here, is along this uh, route, and I will talk about Kasr Zanata and Mshir Segi now. 
This area um, along the Wadi Zendag and the territory of Tatawin, here the investigation has started in the, our investigation has started by reassessing a work that Paul Trousset, the French scholar Paul Trousset, uh, did in the 80s, where he did a survey in the southern part of Tunisia. So we relocated using GPS and GIS all the sites that he identified, and we uh, have uh, uh, checked the existence of these sites, uh, finding that some of them have been destroyed and some of them are actually much bigger than originally recorded. In this process, we also found the new sites, and I'm gonna talk now about one of these new sites, which is the site of Enshir Siga of Segi, which is characterized by the presence of numerous cisterns that you can see here and featuring pottery, primarily African kitchenware from the region of Nabul and Putput, so the north of Tunisia, and Sabrata, so the coast of Tripolitania. So the, 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 the place was functioning as a, as a uh, central <coughs> point of collection for this uh, uh, material. The pottery collected was mostly dated between the second and the fourth century. And the impressive quantity of kitchenware produced in North Africa with the repetitive set of forms, we only have a very limited number of forms, seems to suggest that this settlement, in this settlement, this material was stocked to be traded. And then the main activity of these sites were linked to the presence of this important commercial loop, route along the Wadis and Dag. You can see this is an aerial picture of the site with the, some of the remains visible. Just south of, of Tatawin, we mentioned the fort of Xar Zanata or Kasr Zanata. It's an important site on which the project has focused in a detailed documentation and conservative intervention. Kasr Zanata, in its current layout, is dated to the 12th century with reference to a specific inscription, which is located at the gate, which indicates that the building was constructed after 470 years from the death of the prophet. It was built by Abu Daoud ibn Abd al-Ramar of the Zanata tribe. Its total surface, it's an area of 2,500 square meters and protects approximately 200 cells, small rooms, which are called gorfas, which are arranged on two floors along the internal perimeter of the defensive walls that defended the square area with a single entrance on the southern part of the building. These fortified granaries, Kasr or Gazr, are a peculiar monument of this territory and the Amazigh culture in general. Each cell is the property of a family who protects here the, seasons, the seasonal crops, so the cereals, the olives, the oil, and the dates. The perimeter of this castor is called commonly ellipsoidal. And the internal construction of the cells reflects in its extension, divisions, and modifications the history of each family which passes down the ownership of these cells from generation to generation. We have some uh, of these cells where there is, for instance, the inscription, which refers to someone uh, buying the cell, uh, this room, uh, in exchange of a land with olive trees. So this was a very uh, structured uh, organization. And these cells, these gofas, were really the center of these communities. The typology of Kasr Zanata, however, is anomalous because, as I said, the majority are ellipsoidal, but this is a sort of a square. Uh, although in this, uh, um, this is not an isolated example. So here you can see the inscription. Most of the buildings have this decoration uh, in the interior. 
So the dating back to the 12th century and the analysis of the wall of stratigraphy suggests that this castle was built as a fortified stronghold of the Lord Zanata. So it wasn't built originally as a granary, but it was built as a fortification over the Wadis in Dag, over this main trading route. It was therefore a rebut, a fortified construction built near a more ancient site. In fact, we found during the, uh, our work, during our survey, uh, Roman ceramics nearby. So this was probably a long, uh, a, a site that was occupied from the Roman period into the medieval period, overlooking this major trade route. Um, so it has a long history of occupation. Restoration was conducted in 1993 and more the restoration, I should say, was a reconstruction because here are the pictures of the anthropologist, of the French anthropologist, uh, André Louis, who saw this building in the 80s. And uh, in the 80s, as you can see, only the gate of the building was still standing. Everything else was uh, collapsed. Uh, the building is also compromised by the excavation of some uh, rooms in the mountains, so sort of caves that have put at risk the preservation of the building. As you can see here, is slightly sinking uh, the, uh, the construction. And therefore, we decided that this was, uh, the, uh, was, uh, was uh, a, a, a center for us, a place where we needed to do restoration. So we started to do conservation on the gate of the building, which is one of the uh, very few original uh, part of this monument. So the dominant position over the Zendagwadi of the Kasseri Dibat of Zanata, <clears throat> of the Zanata tribe must have already been the peculiarity of the Roman site that preceded this fortification. Along the Wadi Zendag, in fact, develops an ancient trade route that was in use certainly from the Roman period, if not before, as Mehmedi suggested. This path was leading to the Nafusa and to Gadames, and the region was then big a key for the trans-Saharan trade to Tsuaila and to, uh, and to the south, uh, as you can see, uh, for this map that I've integrated, the map that Mettingly has produced. So it's basically a, a line of uh, trading routes that already um, develops along this major uh, Kasra Zanata. The Jebel Nafusa is uh, and, uh, one of the uh, main uh, sites that I would like to talk about is the site of Wasim. The Jebel Nafusa is the name given to the inter internal limestone of the plateau, uh, about 100 kilometers south of the Libyan coast, which rises between 500 and 900 above the Jafara coastal plain. It is the natural continuation of the Tunisian Dahar in the governorate of Tatawin, with which it describes an arc of approximately 250 kilometers wide. The sudden change in altitude compared to the coastal plain is affected by a myriad of wadis, rivers, which create a complex landscape with very few viable access routes. In this pre-desert plateau, most of the settlements are concentrated towards the northern edge, both for the control of these routes and for the agricultural opportunity offered by the harnessing of the wadis for the best exploitation of the rainfall. The site of Wasim, which is located here, so Rajasthan now moving, leaving the territory of the Tatawin, Tunisia, and moving into the Nafusa with Libya, the first site that we found along this major route is the site of Wazim. And it's the first site that we come across in the Jebel Nafusa as you travel towards the southern internal territories from the Wadi Zendag. Probably already a Roman settlement, as indicated above along the maiden train route, the site of Wazim is a typical village on the top of a mountain characterized by houses partially capped into the mountain and the granary castle on the very top. Or maybe I should say it was. 
This brings me to the first issue about these villages, which is not so much related to the conflict, but more to the impact of the climate change. The site is in fact entirely abandoned and heavily destroyed by the progressive crumbling of the structures and the landslide of the mountain. It is extremely difficult to climb to the top of the mountain and reach the Kasre, as the ruins are literally crumbling down under your feet. The foot of the hill resembles those mountain screes in which the remains of these houses of the village uh, that collapse down can be recognized. In addition to the neglect following the abandonment, the effects of the climate change and the extensive drought which weakened the rocky slopes of the mountain were devastating. And the geological analysis conducted by my, coll my colleague Lisa Moll have shown that little can be done to save these sites, as the issue of these mountains and villages collapses, as in the case of West Sim, is a matter of time. I'm not saying this is happening tomorrow. It might happen in 500 years or 600 years, but there is very little we can do to say to stop this project pro process. We can delay it. So the situation makes the recording and the documentation of this landscape an absolute priority associated with the creation of detailed management plan to delay this process of demolition. And when I say the recording is by using new methodology. We have 3D modeling nowadays, digital reconstruction, and we can reproduce almost entirely these sites. Drought obviously also has a heavy effect on the natural environment, making it increasingly inhospitable. One of the main livelihood resources of the region over the last two millennia, namely the cultivation of the olive trees, is progressively disappearing in these latitudes due to the lack of water. And in the Jebel Nafusa, a similar evidence of continuity of occupation from the Roman into the Arab period is also offered by the site of Wigu that you can see is further down along the Jebel here. We recorded the site with drone photogrammetry in 2022 as a part of a campaign, as I said, to aiming to document the majority of the sites considered at, at, at risk in the Nafusa. Wigu is known from literary sources to have been the site of one of the oldest mosques in the region in the ninth century. The site extends for more than a kilometer and is characterized by scattered lines of buildings which with good stone mansory and typologically similar with two rooms overlooking from the opposite side in a central open area. The analysis of the uh, aerial images have has, has allowed us to identify five earlier nuclei where a preliminary field, work, field walking survey conducted by our colleague Mofter Haladad has recorded through the evidence of the pottery an uninterrupted occupation of the site from the Roman late Roman to the late medieval period. These data shed new light on our understanding of the development of the occupation of the Nafusa through time as the area has never been investigated systematically. It appears possible, in fact, to suggest that small Roman settlements, probably farms, developed into a village into the medieval period when communities clustered into larger settlements, primarily due to insecurity. However, the hunger for arable land induced by drought is now the main threat to the site of Wigu. In fact, the use of mechanical means for the arrangement of cultiva cultiva cultivable terraces has already heavily altered the morphology of these sites. And if the authorities do not intervene in the protection of these sites, the situation will get even worse. In addition to the increase uh, in drought, climate change has led to an increase in devastating rainfall phenomena. Less rain, but all concentrated in a few rainfall episodes with often devastating consequences. From the point of view of the conservation of the, of the built heritage, this is a highly worrying phenomenon. It seems absurd to fear rain in a region where it arrives only once or twice every two or three years. But the recent violence of the rainfall of, on this vernacular architecture, whose walls often use earthy binders, 
weakened by the neglect following the abandonment of the inhabited centers can be fatal. The Kafsar Gunnery of Kabau, and you can see the location here, is one of the best preserved in the region and still considered by the local communities as the monument of identity, even though it has not been in use for some time. And this is a typical Kafsar with the uh, ellipsodal form, not like the Kafsar Zanata that was square, probably because of its uh, pre-Kafsar pre function. Although the roof is periodically restored together with the rainwater uh, disposal system, an entirely sector of the granary, and you can see from this animation, this part, not exactly. uh, it's not moving. Okay, why? Okay, I will, I will uh, go ahead. The gap created by this collapse has obviously weakened the adjacent structure, which are still at risk of collapse. And Kasser Kabau is one of the sites where the project is planning a conservation intervention and uh, in collaboration with the institutions and the local communities, planning the works of what is probably the first complete 3D survey of an Amaz Amazigh Kasser in the region, as we are also documenting three-dimensionally all the rooms inside the building. However, one of the greatest threats to the Jebel Nafusa heritage remains the human action. War, ideological religious clashes, and greed for unlikely treasure have had in recent years a devastating impact on this territory. In the photo you see what remains of the marabout in the Abu Mahdi Cemetery destroyed <coughs> destroyed with dynamite charges by safe militias during 2015. The building is a few meters away from the Abi Mahdi Mosque and Madrasa, one of the most important among the Quranic schools in the 16th century, fortunately spared from these clashes. The systematic destructions of the marabout, that is the mausoleum of religious leaders who are traditionally venerated in North Africa Islam, was a serious episode of religious clashes with obliterated buildings, often of historical as well as religious importance. These types of destructions, although only rarely reported, have been very, um, very extensive in the region and have been recorded in more recent time, but for instance, uh, the uh, Yamina. And this is an example of a marabout. You can see how, how this looked like. <clears throat> As in every part of the world, treasure hunters in Libya are serious danger to the archaeological heritage. The years following the 2011 conflict were characterized by a let up in state control of the territory. And this opened the way for treasure hunters who had no scruples in using mechanical excavators and destroying important monuments in the belief to find the pot of gold coins obviously hidden according to them underneath. And these photos that I'm going to show, second. and these photos show the remains of the Roman mausoleum of Twil Malia, as it was. And here, um, it was entirely destroyed, uh, making a, a hole in the natural rock where these criminals were looking for uh, treasure. So nothing is there anymore. The destruction of Twil al Malia is a sadly irreversible, as you can imagine, difficult to upset due to its obvious irrationality and madness. But it must be a warning for the management of protection in territories where more extensive campaign to educate local communities should be implemented. It is difficult to counter the madness and ignorance of every single person, but it is possible to trigger a form of permanent control through the building of the awareness of a community rooted in the territory. That is very, in fact, linked to its territory. Now, dealing with the monuments that were directly damaged by the conflict, we come to the site of Sabrata, one of the World Heritage sites on the Mediterranean coast in the northwestern sector of Tripolitania. In this site, together with Lisa Moll's team from University of West England, we have experimented with a new methodology 
that combines the most advanced documentation system used for the assessment of the conservative conditions and the evaluation of the structural stability together with the study of the ballistic and impact on stone deterioration. So, I think uh, because we changed this as a pointer, it doesn't work the animation on again. Can we change it back? Or because I have to show it. <clears throat> Thank you. Sorry. Okay. Yes. <clears throat> So Sabrata is one of the major centers, as you can see here, of Tripolitania on the West Libya. So we have now left the, uh, the Nafusa and we have moved to the coast. And Sabrata is one of the major Punic outposts. It was founded as an emporium, developed monumentally in the Ro Roman and Byzantine period, and it continued to be occupied after the Arab expansion, although probably reduced to a small village up to the 10th century when it became again an important center because the sources tell us that this was a place for taxes, the payments for the trans-Saharan trade. Um, <clears throat> so this is the final result of our documentation. Among the numerous and impressive monument at the site located in the east of the ancient city is the theater which was most likely built between the end of the second and the beginning of the third century. And unfortunately, clashes among different groups of militias during 2016 resulted in significant damage of the site of Sabrata. The theater was used as a shield and was therefore heavily affected by the crossfire. Initial evaluation of the impact of the theater was carried out in 2018 during the project training in action in collaboration with the Libyan trainees, but more detailed analysis was required uh, and uh, it was not possible before 2020. So we, we took the opportunity when it was possible. The project was developed in order to document the surface dam damage and overall stability of the theater at Sabrata and inform an impact assessment of the monument necessary prior to any conservation. So as it, it was deemed necessary to evaluate the destruction caused by each impact on the monument and assess if this damage was compromising the stability of the theater as a wall, as a whole. As a whole. It was essential, sorry. It was essential that this work was done soon to avoid the long-term degradation and deterioration of the monument. Documenting these damages is essential in order to proceed with the restoration and to form a clear understanding of the different possible interventions and, and long-term ramifications. And this was also uh, offered the opportunity to evaluate the structural stability of the theater since many years have passed since the anastylosis of the scene of the theater conducted during the colonial period. So due to the height of the remains of the building, um, aerial photography was deemed to be the most efficient and robust methodology in order to capture the entire building. So we used the drone and we produced the three model that I've just shown as a basic element. We produced over 100, 800 aerial images with a drone survey, and that was then combined to create the 3D model that you have uh, seen. Here is the flight plan. <clears throat> After the successful creation of the 3D model of the aerial imagery, the next step of the project was to investigate the model and assess the damage for any clear sign of ballistic impact. Overall, the survey identified over 160 uh, places where the damage of the bullets were conducted. And you can see here a detail, all the green point to the pink point. In addition to ballistic impact caused by small arms fire, 
The survey also identified a large damage characteristic of a high explosive anti-tank munition, such as a rocket propelled grenade, normally used against the tanks that once entered inside the tank, and in this case, unfortunately, the wall of the theater, explodes. And the same may have occurred in the case of this building. And these were data coming from Lisa Mole um, team that is working specifically on ballistic and analysis. So you can see, in this case, there is very little we can do until uh, we measured and we evaluated the impact, but we will have to, when they remove the stone, to replace it to evaluate fully the impact inside the wall of the monument. The largest part of the theater damaged by the bullets was part of the restoration during the Italian colonial period, where original blocks found on sites were used together with new blocks cut specifically for the anastylosis of the building. Reinforced concrete was also used in this restoration. And the reconstruction of the theater took place by Giacomo Guidi between 1934 and 1936, and Giacomo Caputo between 1936 and 1937. It was effectively a reconstruction. The restoration, which is in fact implied a substantial reconstruction, was intentionally left unfinished with the specific idea that the monument could be further completed in any time in the future when new information about the structure of the building were occurring. The material from the collapse of the building was being carefully recorded and cataloged and ready to be re relocated in the anastylosis. And Guidi specific int specifically intending to make minimal the addition of new material. And the major reconstruction focused on the front scene of the theater, as you can see here. <clears throat> During the restoration, concrete was used ex extensively, especially to integrate the 96 columns and the capitals of the front scene, because at the time it was considered a very innovative material, concrete. So the tree model was tested by specific software in order to evaluate the structural stability of the monument in particular in the part where the columns are. And uh, the data analyzed, uh, and the data from the analysis performed on the field were used to identify the most damaged part uh, of the theater. In fact, when measuring humidity and variation in the temperatures, it was evident that the east and the west wall part of the theater were the most affected and therefore the stones were further weakened. Moreover, through the analysis of the monument that the team led by Lisa Moll uh, were able to reconstruct how the shooting took place and which areas were mostly affected. So here in blue are the outgoing fire and the red arrows are the inco ingoing, incoming fire. And uh, it's, uh, uh, it's interesting to see that this uh, shooting took place primarily exactly on the east and the west walls which are also the most weakened by the humidity and the variation in temperature. This is the first project ever conducted, combining archaeological 3D documentation and ballistic geomorphological and structural analysis. And it allowed us to write up a full report and recommendations submitted to UNESCO and ICOMOS for future conservation projects in the monument. In the last two years, we have uh, we have, uh, and I'm returning now to the Nafusa, we have started to do a similar work on the site of Sufit. Sufit is another monument that was literally at the middle of the armed conflict between government forces and rebel militias in the 2011 revolution. Uh, it is the late antique Roman mausoleum of, of Sufit in the Nafusa monument. The mausoleum is a quadrangular tower built of squared limestone ashlars with a burial chamber and a ground floor. It has a stepped base surmounted by two floors decorated by a double order of Corinthian half pilasters that you can see here. From a formal point of view, the monument improperly takes up formal elements of the tower mausolea built in the imperial age 
in the coastal plain, and he stated on the basis of the architectural element between the end of the third and the first half of the fourth century. Reconstructive restoration intervention were carried out in the 90s by the uh, um, Department of Antiquities of Libya. The building is located at the southern edge of the summit plain of a hill about seven kilometers southeast of Yefren in the eastern sector of the Nafusa mountain. At the outbreak of the revolution, a small garrison uh, of the government army settled on this hill to control the road below and share the nearby village of Kala where a group of rebel, rebel militias had settled. The defend, to defend themselves, as you can see, uh, from the night attack of the militia, the Gaddafi soldiers dug a deep trench around the summit, affecting all other ancient tombs near the mausoleum and compromising the stability of the mausoleum itself. The conflict for this strategic position lasted about three months, during which the mausoleum was hit several times by explosions and bullets shot against the the government the gar garrisons. When the rebels finally prevailed, the hill was occupied by soldiers who used the mausoleum for shooting exercises. And you can see all the bullet samples in the building. If, as if this all were not enough, it, at an unspecified moment in the last five years, this mausoleum was also affected by treasure hunters, fortunately not as devastating as Twil al Malia. The looters looked for the treasure in the body of the monument, emptying it, it, it entirely up to the extrados of the vault of the, burial of the burial chamber and leaving the entire structure empty and more exposed. The monument is the subject of a case study as part of the project of the conservative assessment of the buildings damaged by war events in collaboration with Lisa Moore. First of all, the photogrammetry survey was carried out using drone and creating the 3D model that I have shown and using G GPS point for measurements. A high resolution 3D model was made of 90 million faces, the one I just showed you, and was uh, obtained uh, where the, the smallest details of the mansory are, mansory are legible and from this plan sections and elevation were drawn. This data set was delivered to the structural engineers and to the geologists of the team from Lisa Moll, who in turn developed a mapping for further direct measurements of the monument with an electronic hardness measurement, a protimeter for a rapid moisture assessment and a targeted observation through a digital microscope. <clears throat> the measurements are still in progress by the Libyan colleagues of the department will be processed for a complete di diagnosis of the state of the stone and other material used in the restoration of the monument and based on that, the conservative intervention of the mausoleum will be designed. So overall, I hope this interview of a very complex set of projects which combines several different methodology has allowed me to offer you insight of the current situation, the difficulties and the challenges that the Libyan heritage is facing. We need to bear in mind that these challenges are faced by many other countries whose heritage has been put under threat in recent years due to conflict and more globally due to climate change. These are territories extremely rich of monuments whose maintenance is challenging. I should perhaps add that the impact of colonial archaeology also has a responsibility as a large number of sites were excavated and exposed. And as we know, excavated monuments present the problem of long-term preservation. The more numerous they are, the more they require resources, time, workforces, and technology. And here the challenge begins far beyond the 2011. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I omitted at the beginning to mention um, the procedure for asking questions for those online. We're about to have a Q&A session, um, as well as taking questions from the room. Um, 
we can take them from those of you on Zoom and YouTube as well. If you'd like to ask a question online, please type it into the chat function on Zoom or YouTube, and I will ask as many as I can at the end of the lecture. So we are at the end of the lecture. Um, questions from the room? Anyone? No, then, then perhaps I could start with one. <laughs> Seeing these monuments pockmarked with bullet holes and other mu munitions, and you're mapping them, and you're obviously concerned to address any structural problems that they're causing and put the uh, long-term future of the, the structures at risk. But are you intending to leave the bullet holes where they're not causing long-term problems as one of the layers in the history of the place? Um, or are you intending to undertake cosmetic repair to try to obliterate the memory of the bad time? Well, thank you. This is a good question. So this is not something that I can decide myself. It's uh, the Department of Antiquities who will decide what to do. But uh, Lisa Moll uh, uh, is present uh, uh, online today, and one uh, thing that she is doing, she is, uh, in fact, uh, shooting stones as a uh, exercise to see uh, how the angle of the shooting impact uh, on the on the stones. And most of these bullets uh, depend on the angle of the shooting. So if they shoot from the front, yeah. the damage uh, is not substantial in the in the stones. Uh, so the repair would be only cosmetic, and from our point of view, it's not necessary mm. because the bullets are part of the history of the monument as anything else. Yes. Uh, but uh, in the case of the shooting taking place in a specific angle, they might damage the structure of the building. In the case of the bullet used for the tank, for tanks mm. in the theater of Sabrata, I think uh, interventions have to be done uh, rapidly. The protimeter that they use for measurements of humidity is to calculate the, uh, and I'm speak, speaking again as I was Lisa Moll here, um, used to uh, identify moisture that can uh, weaken the stones. So every measurement, every single impact of bullet is evaluated fully to then decide whether it's necessary a specific intervention or if the presence is only cosmetic and in this case, uh, a lot of uh, monuments were also used during the Second World War for uh, practicing shooting, and the and the bullets, uh, the, the the holes of the bullets are still visible. So we don't want to change them. Yes, thank you. I, I, you probably know in in London after the Second World War, the neoclassical buildings like the Victoria and Albert Museum and the Tate. Um, were the, the shrapnel um, holes, craters, were left other than where it was necessary structurally to repair them. One can still see those marks of conflict today. Yes, what we want to do here is to document everything and to provide a plan for the long-term mm. preservation of these sites. And cosmetic intervention cost, and if they are not absolutely necessary, there are a lot of buildings that require yeah. Urgent. 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 Ur because you had firing out and firing in. Am I correct in assuming there is no ideological destruction such as occurred in Syria? There isn't deliberate devastation of monuments because they belong to the wrong ideology. It's correct. There is no deliberate destructions of uh, Roman monuments or even medieval monuments. But there has been, in the case of the Maraboots, uh, of the tomb of the saints that I mentioned, the one in Abu Mahdi, the destruction of these Maraboots, which are often very historical, uh, often they go back to the 9th century or 10th century, and 
often they are built on top of earlier, earlier sites, there has been quite an extensive destructions, yes. So unfortunately, this is the case. But it's not ideological, apart from this case, religious case, uh, everything else is mostly done by looters uh, uh, or by people who are working, uh, using or destroying monuments to have more arable land, uh, taking advantage of the lack of control in the country. Yeah. Yeah, I have to say that Jutbena Fuse is massive, it's very extended, extremely difficult to control overall. And so is, for instance, the Tadrata Kakus, which is a desert with all these rock cars uh, spread in uh, thousands of kilometers. And it's very, very difficult to control everything by the authorities. So they should have millions of people to be able to do so. Right. Next question. Do we have any online yet? So, uh, what progress has been made in combating the illegal sale and export of antiquities? Oh, this is a, a, something that I didn't talk about today. I've done a lot of work, in fact, uh, in terms of uh, fighting against illicit trafficking. And uh, from 2014 to 2019, we have worked with the Libyan colleagues to create an app for the rapid documentation of uh, objects uh, in museum and in sites, and for the creation of a digital uh, database of museums. Because one of the major issues in all these countries, I have to say, in the MENA region is that they have a lot of material uh, but they don't have uh, uh, catalogs, or if they have catalogs, they are handwritten with no images. And we know that police, and I worked with Interpol as well, they can only intervene and seize an object if they can prove exactly the provenance. Mm -hmm. So if there is uh, this uh, um, lack of images, uh, this is a big problem. So we try to implement this system for developing a digital catalog of the museum that we gave to Libya in 2022, and we are now implementing the same system in Iraq. So it is a, an, an issue. Uh, we, have, we have been working in particular with the Department of Antiquities and with the French colleagues, uh, uh, in particular the site of Cyrene that I mentioned at the beginning that has all these graves uh, cut into the mountains. Uh, it's a Greek settlement and then a Roman settlement that has a very specific type of statues. Uh, and uh, uh, which are very unique of Cyrene, so they can be traced in international auction houses. And a lot of work has been done in collaboration between us and above everything, everyone by Morgan Bilzik of the French Mission of Libya. So there has been a lot of work and the uh, looting and the trade of illicit uh, antiquities has increased since 2011. This is a phenomenon that uh, is for the whole MENA region has changed before the, the looting was for high quality, very expensive objects. Now the looting is about anything. It can be a coin, it can be a lamp, it can be a piece of pottery. There was in Libya in a period, a period in which there was a web souk where you could buy anything, where they were selling objects uh, uh, from everywhere. So it's a, it's a major issue that we are trying to Thank tackle. Thank you. Any other questions? Gentlemen here. Um, so the focus of your work was primarily, of course, on the endangerment of these sites. But I was wondering, um, particularly, you know, sort of the rarity of excavation of modern battlefields, etc. To what extent, particularly as regards the theatre, did you feel that you were somehow getting a sense for the ferocity of the fighting, the number of people that were there, and that not only were you looking at sort of the damage to this site, but also how it was used in a in a modern war, which is something that you know many of us wouldn't have got would have no sense of at all. Yes, so working in these sites and doing excavation in these sites at this moment is extremely complicated. So that's why uh, we start with the documentation and the collection of information that we have. In the future, this is uh, maybe possible, and, but uh, at the moment, uh, what? Uh, all the energies and the effort and the uh, technology and the money has to be put into recording 
as much as possible. Uh, because as I said, it's very little has been recorded on the Jabena Fusa for a long time. Thanks. Questions? Anyone? Any online? No. Well then, thank you very much indeed. Um, for fascinating lecture in 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 a pioneering field, I fear. Um, now. I give notice that the next meeting will be on Thursday, the 28th of March, 2024, when we will hear a paper, Vesuvius CE 79, how archaeology, art, and fiction transformed a natural disaster into a human tragedy by Dr. John Brewer. The meeting stands adjourned and the reception follows.